Welcome to Radio Free HPC. This is where we talk about supercomputing, high performance computing, and other technology topics. I'm your Toastmaster, Rich Bruckner from Inside HPC, with my co hosts, Dan Olds from Gabriel Consulting and Henry Newman from Instrumental. Now let's get to the show. So, hey, you guys, how's it going? I'm doing well, Rich. I hope your day's going well. The week's about to end, and uh, look forward to talking to you and Dan, especially talking to Dan about tape. Nothing like tape, eh, Henry? <laughs> Nothing like hearkening back to your days when you used to punch <laughs> cards by hand before you, even re- used, before you even used the machines to do it. <laughs> Dan, I, I actually remember punching cards. I am that old. But uh, quickly I learned that my typing skills were of a limited, and uh, I got an, a, a, a TI Silent 700 very quickly. You know, I heard that Henry invented the Chad. I, I can't confirm that, but uh, I had, had heard that. Back in the, I'm not that old, Rich, but thank you. <laughs> Back in the days when you were hand whittling those punch cards, <laughs> not just punching the holes, but actually carving out the card from from big sheets of card stock. But Dan, I do have more hair than you. <laughs> <laughs> Is tape dead? Is tape a legacy technology, or is it alive and well and just not talked about so much? I guess the real question here is, is that parrot completely dead or just mostly dead, Henry? And, and Dan, you know, you and I have discussed this way back in New Orleans, and it's not dead at all. And I think it's alive and well, and it will continue to be alive and well until there is a new technology to replace it. Because archive is a critical aspect of both big data and supercomputing, and there is no way to do archive today efficiently, cost-effectively, and reliably except with tape. What about the cloud, Henry? Just put it up in the cloud. That's all it is. What the hell's wrong with you? Tape. Put it in the cloud. And Dan, what do you think they're going to have to run in the cloud? Just given the power and cooling, you can't put that many disk drives out there. Sure you can. They just pile them up to the sky, right? Well, I'm sure it's the cloud, Henry. By definition, it's (laughs) unlimited. It's limitless. It's it's limitless. Do you do you really believe that? Is the network pipe to the cloud unlimited? You know, part of it, Dan, is you might be able to put some of this in the cloud, but the cloud providers are are going to charge you for it. Look at the look at the cloud cost per per gigabyte per month, and what uh, some of the big cloud providers are doing. But you get you know, out of if, you if, get out of the huge expense of those cartridges. <laughs> well, what's the what's the you know looking at uh, the cost per gigabyte at some of the cloud providers, uh, you might get out of the huge expense of the cartridges, and it might be cost effective for small amounts of data. But when you got thirty or forty petabytes of data, Dan, you, there's no way one you can move it to the cloud, and two move it back to your application no, after I, you've moved it. I was kidding on that, and I agree. I, I think the only way you would even consider moving that kind of data, or even even data much smaller, is not through the network, but through spindles or cartridges via Federal Express. Uh, and that, that means you also have to have an application on both ends that can read those files you know, via Federal Express. That's one of the nice things that has come about in the last few years is a, a new uh, format that's called LTFS, Linear Tape Open File System, which basically allows you to have a standardized way for many applications of reading a tape. It's getting a lot of, a lot of traction in certain communities. Going back to this issue, and, and I, I do agree that tape has a place, absolutely in HPC and probably at Enterprise, but at Enterprise, it, it has this connotation as being old, archaic, um, expensive, little use, and I don't know how it got dubbed that way. It got dubbed that way because of backup. And backup really, if you look at what, what my view of what happened in the early part of the 2000s, we got to a point where the tape performance per drive became faster than the network. And the way we solved that problem for backup, and backup was the major tape application of the time, yep. was we, we created VTLs. 
So the, instead of writing to tape, which was going to be doing these the shoe shining because you couldn't stream the data, you'd write to a disc and then you'd write to tape. So essentially well, the disc acts as a big cache. Correct. And that's what happened with VTLs. And then towards the middle part of the decade, you still couldn't get your backups done and people started moving. You know, dedupe became available towards the you know second half of the middle part of the decade, 2006, six seven. There was a big move to dedupe. There a lot of this data was dedupable in the backup arena. And what do you need tape for anymore? You yeah. can dedupe all this stuff. Well, dedupe and compression and snapshotting and a lot of things helped reduce the the size of those backups. But from from an economic standpoint, you're still getting considerably lower cost per gig stored with tape. Uh, especially for a lot of the archival data is not dedupable. You might be able to dedupe an X-ray, but you're not going to dedupe much of an MR scan. Yeah, and retrieval times are reasonable too, aren't they? If you architect it correctly, absolutely. I mean, it's all it's like any other storage problem or any computational problem or any problem, you have to architect it correctly to make sure you, you meet your retrieval goals. I'm not seeing that there's many new customers to tape. Well, <laughs> the archive problem and archiving of data has become the new tape application. But the problem, and, and you're right, Dan, you said earlier in your one of your, your tirades is that the tape, uh, it's difficult to use. Most of the HSM applications that are out there require a significant amount of technical resources to manage them. There are people who are building more, uh, moving towards the appliance model for HSM. I think that's going to make it a lot easier to use tape than it is today. How far off are the products where uh, archiving to tape would be as easy as archiving to disk, technically? Is there any I reason why you couldn't have those now if somebody cared? There is no reason in my mind you couldn't have them now if someone cared and put the effort into it. But right now, the folks that would do that are either drive people by DNA or they don't perceive there's a big enough market there. Or there, there's a myriad of other reasons we're still just coming out of the recession. I mean, people are still wary to invest a lot of money into new products. You'd think the tape vendors would be pushing this more. And I would agree with that. And maybe sometime we should interview with some tape vendors as part of our part of our series on this. I I think that'd be very valuable. Tape has a, a long, healthy uh, future ahead of it. It's kind of the way our industry moves, too, is that every time there's a new technology discs aren't new but as discs got bigger and faster more reliable and all of that and, and much more affordable suddenly sales take off which they did and we're talking back in the you know 80s now and 90s but there's this giddy aura around a new product in that it's made everything else obsolete and that there's no reason to have anything else in the server side it's like the folks that that have talked and probably still do talk uh, about mainframes being dead, for example. Still lots and lots of mainframes out there. Customers and, are and still fact, buying them. And in there's been a growth in mainframes, Dan, in the last few years. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and I think, you know, the flash uh, vendors would argue that uh, disk is dead, right? And that's yeah. their job. Yeah, exactly, so. exactly. But people just sort of parrot these arguments and they don't seem to realize, and it's particularly in the industry press and some pundits, but they tend to talk about what they know without having any context of why there are other substitutes out there are out there and or why they're maybe still Dan out there. Being, being the cynic in the group and not being uh, part of the industry pundit community, uh, maybe it's because that's because they're paid to do it. Well, of course. <laughs> well, yeah, that goes without saying, Henry. So rice is getting put in somebody's bowl in order to, to say that stuff. All right, so how, how do we want to wrap this up, guys? Uh, we do have a new advertiser, at least one that we're working on. I don't know if you guys have thought much about ways that you can generate more electricity just out of things you do every day in your home. Yeah. A company that's pursuing that, uh, Home Hydro. 
what they do is they put mini hydro turbines in every water line you have. <laughs> and they generate electricity based on your willingness to wait to get water. <laughs> A little latency there. A little bit. There's, there is some increased latency. They are, they're pretty upfront with that, that depending on how you move the needle in terms of water delivery speed versus power generation, that can impact the length of a shower considerably <laughs> or how long your dishwasher takes to go through a cycle. Dan, it's going to be 106 here Tuesday. How's that going to impact me? Well, if... Turn on your sprinkler and go have a cup of coffee. <laughs> you turn on your sprinkler, it might take a little while for the plants to actually get wet. But that's a good idea. They're working up some use cases and some uh, third-party testing, be able to see exactly how much uh, juice you can get out of this. We'll see how it goes. But they might uh, be signing on as an advertiser soon. Terrific. Well, we, we love to hear from our sponsors, Dan, and keep us posted on that. Or Dan, or not keep us informed on that. <laughs> <laughs> It would be good to have a full uh, case study on that. <laughs> yeah, I would like to see the scientific basis behind it. That's it for this edition of Radio Free HPC. Thank you for listening, and be sure to check back often for new episodes. Also, check out our website for more content, links, and a place for you to let us know what you think about the show. We're at RadioFreeHPC.com. Thanks again. We'll be back with another exciting episode real soon.